Hi, this is Shauna, the CEO and founder of Fuel Talent. One of the things I have loved most in my 25-year recruiting career has always been the stories that people tell. Stories of leadership, career choices, company ideas, and team building. My inspiration for starting the What Fuels You podcast came from being curious about people's lives and wanting to help share their stories. What path brought them to this place? What decisions did they make that led to failures and successes? Who influenced those decisions and what lessons were learned along the way? I hope you enjoy the What Fuels You podcast. Alyssa Lee Nonan, today's guest on the What Fuels You podcast, is nearing 24 years as the founder and CEO of Gourmando Catering. What started as a 470-square-foot, four-table cafe in Pike Place Market has evolved into Seattle's leading catering and gourmet box lunch company. Alyssa is known for building her business around the working parent model, leading by example while raising her two children. She is an Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year finalist, a 40 Under 40 honoree, and an incredible part of the Seattle community, among being a good friend. Welcome, Alyssa. Oh, thank you for having me. You're so welcome. So, uh, obviously, as I was preparing for this, I'm like, we only listed a few things. There's a ton of other things. I'm like, <laughs> what is up, girl? You're so humble. Oh. I never, like, you don't brag about these things. Oh, that's very kind of you. Yes, and warm-hearted and gorgeous to boot. Oh, so, thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. Um, okay, we're starting with rapid fire, and I know you well enough to know that you're going to be like, what? Yeah, no, that's exactly Are you ready? What I got I'm you, thinking. girl. What? I got you. Because since you're in the food business, what's mm-hmm. the strangest thing that you've ever eaten? Oh, gosh. I mean, crickets. I don't know. Are you, a, are you like, open to trying new things? You know what? Here's the thing. I, I am absolutely an equal opportunist when it comes to food. I mean, I think people often think, well, you're in the business. You're probably a sophisticated diner. I'll eat corn dogs at 7-Eleven, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that I also have an enormous amount of respect for fine dining. I mean, that's where the genius is, and it's an art form into itself. And so I have nothing but respect for that. But I also like a great diner. I mean, yeah. you'll find me at Randy's down on airport. <laughs> way so <laughs> I'm going with way. you crickets <laughs> right. um, okay this one's heavier what's your biggest fear you know my biggest fear I think as a business owner I've been doing this for t- almost 24 years now and I've got 253 employees and some of them have been with me for you know 18 years and I mean I feel I feel a real sense of responsibility and a deep commitment to them and I think my fear is you know, you want to try and build a business and you need to take risk, but you want to be thoughtful because there's a lot of people that depend on you making the right decisions mm-hmm. and being thoughtful about how you grow. So I would say my fear is, you know, you don't want to fail your teams mm-hmm. and, you know, you want to make sure you protect the business so that you can take care of the teams. Yeah, I love it. Um, what's your favorite cuisine besides corn dogs? <laughs> oh, that's cute. You know, I love a great steak. I really do. You I have, have a good to say, steakhouse? I really. Well, you know, it's funny. I'm going to tell a quick story here, and we can always edit this it is, out. This but... is this is rapid fire. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. No, no, Never kidding. Mind. I want to hear your story. <laughs> right. I want to hear your story about the, the steak. So I've always loved red meat. I'm I'm a big fan of that. But I remember uh, I was in college, and I went to meet my grandmother for dinner, and it was August, 90 degrees out. So I pull up to meet her, and we get in her big, huge El Dorado fancy red car, and she's like, "I'm taking you to dinner. We're on our." way and I'm thinking oh this is great we're probably going to go to Anthony's we'll be right on the water can't wait get outside and she rolls up to the Stuart Anderson Steakhouse (laughs) and I'm like what no no and she's like come on get in here and so we get in and you got to adjust your eyes because it's super dark and you've got the big huge you know booths and we sit down and she looks at me and she's like Alyssa I'm going to tell you one thing there is nothing better than a great steak in a very dark room. And you know, it's so true. It was so true. And it completely Words reset. of wisdom, Grandma. Yeah. I was like, you know what? She's right. That's exactly it. So, was she a foodie? You know what? She she loved food, but she she was never a foodie. But, um, you know, she was a great cook and, and she was a beautiful, just a beautiful soul and yeah. a great personality. Nice. Okay. Best trip you've ever taken? Oh, Italy. I loved Italy. It was very inspiring. I actually did an exchange program over there, and that's when I realized I really wanted to to do something in the world of food. Oh, that's great. And um, besides me, I'm just kidding, who makes you (laughs) laugh more than anyone in the world? You know my kids. My kids are hilarious. They're great. I can't wait to meet them. Um, And this is our inside joke, but for our listeners, what beauty product can you not live without? 
Oh, that is so funny. That's a great one. We both love our products. Oh, we do. We are. Yep, yeah, that's for sure. I would say I love the Laura Mercier tinted moisturizer. Oh, yeah. Love it. Yeah. It's a nice go-to. It's a great one. Especially going into summer. Oh, yeah. A nice it's plug good. for Laura Mercier. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> okay, so tell um, tell our listeners, obviously, you're the CEO and founder of Gourmando, but we're going to take it back to um, old school. Mm. Little girl, Alyssa, you're from here, Seattle. from Seattle. Fourth generation Seattleite. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What do you think of Seattle? Like, do you feel proud to be from here? I love Seattle. I mean, it is my community. And, you know, my great grandfather immigrated here from Italy and he was the immigrant doctor in town. So we have roots back in Georgetown in Seattle, which was the little Italy of the city back in the day. And I feel, you know, a huge connection to the city. Um, and I'm really proud to be a part of it. You have siblings. I do. I have one younger sister. One younger sister. Yeah. And so what was your childhood like here? Were you like suburban, city? We were city kids, you know, and um, very, very close to our parents. Our parents uh, divorced when we were young. I think my sister was about three and I was about five. And mm -hmm. uh, my sister and I were close. And, you know, it's interesting because I think family can look a lot of different ways. And even though Absolutely. my parents were divorced, they were really dedicated and devoted parents. And we knew that we were a big deal. We were prioritized. And, you know, I think what I learned from them is, is just the rhythm and the rituals of, you know, meals together. And I think also just the routines and traditions, they're critical. And, and that's what creates family. Mm -hmm. So I feel real fortunate. The other thing I would say, too, is as a parent myself, what's interesting about my family is they always believed in us. That's huge. And you know what's so funny is that I think growing up with parents who had that mentality, you just figured you could do it. Absolutely. Because whether they really believed in you or not, yes. you thought they did. Yes. And there's something about that that allows you to take risk, and I think it, it really creates a base of confidence. Absolutely. So. Did you have, like, something to fall back on as far as... Um, security? No, actually, one of the other things that I think my parents did that I want to continue to do for my kids is they were always there for me for emotional support, and they were always there to, to help, but I needed to find myself on my own. When I started mm -hmm. my company, I refinanced my car. I started it with $4,000, you know, and they were there to support me, but they were really clear, like, this is your dream. You need to own it. You need to understand mm -hmm. that value. I wow. mean, they were my and number what, one what customers, <laughs> you know. They're like, we'll get another box lunch, please. <laughs> well, no, no, because the first day sales were $36, which didn't count because 24 of it was my mother, you I know. I love that. <laughs> but, That's a good mama. So, you you know, would do the same yeah, thing for yeah, your kids. Yeah, and my dad's the same. They're great. I love it. Well, we're going to get more into you as a mom because that's one of the sides of you that I love the most. But what, what do you think as far as their values? Were they really clear? Really crystal clear. I would say my father, he has such an extraordinary integrity. And he also was incredibly humble. If there was anything I learned from my father, it is you, you've got to be humble and stay humble and be curious and ask questions. Always be learning. Mm -hmm. And he held himself to a really high standard of integrity and he held my sister and I to that too and I think that that was really important and that was a business lesson that became really really critical as I was growing the company mm -hmm. you, if you're aligned with your values you know that's what the the foundation of your corporate culture mm -hmm. relies on is your values. Mm -hmm. And so when and did you set those on early that, on or did, did it take a while? I did. Well, I think that, you know, your company develops out of what you value and mm -hmm. what you believe in. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's really important to, to, to recognize that. And then my mom was fearless. She was absolutely fearless. And mm -hmm. she was a... Um, working single mother, and she was an inspiration. I watched her, and I thought, well, if she can own a company and she can figure it out, I think that's what I'll do. Mm -hmm. She really, you know, kind of blazed a trail for me and was inspiring. That's inspired. amazing. That's yeah. unique also to have that. Yeah, back in the day, you know, and it was tough for her. For sure. So, yeah. And so what were you like as a little girl compared to who I got to meet as an adult? I was very awkward, very awkward. I was very late bloomer, so mm. I read a lot, you know, and... Mm -hmm. um, a little bit of a homebody. Do you think that the people who knew you back then would be surprised to see your success? I think as I got older, people could potentially recognize. I mean, I started working at 14. But yeah, I what worked, were you doing when you were 14? Well, I started as a dishwasher at Ferrell's, which was an ice I cream parlor. I love Ferrell's. Loved it. We used to have it. one in our way. Oh, it's good. Ferrell's. It's funny because I was in the dish pit, and I was working in the dish pit for a few months, and I went to my manager, and I said, you know, I think I'm ready for more opportunity. I'd really like to advance with Ferrell's. And I remember her looking at me, and I was super scrawny and awkward, and I was 14. She's like, yeah, I just don't know if you've got what it's going to take. <laughs> and so, What exactly was she looking yeah, 
I'm not for. really clear on that. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. Well, I might have to re- I might have to come back to that. Oh, but, interesting. Yeah. And so you worked at Farrell's yep. and then went to UW. So I did Farrell's when I was 14, 15, and then I started working in restaurants right away um, after that. And I have a regret I loved, that I never worked in restaurants. I think I would have loved that. It's amazing. The yeah. energy, the pace, yeah. the community. You yeah. really do fall in love with the industry. Oh, for sure. So, so I started working in, in some of the really great restaurants in the city. I, I had the opportunity to, to work with some really incredible restaurateurs. I worked with the Rosella family. Family at Sostanza. I worked with Luciano Bardinelli at Settebello and Streza. Um, and I also worked with Jimmy Malavizis at Adriatica. So I'm, some hearing, just I'm seeing a places. theme here. Yeah, yeah. Love uh, Italian. Yeah, in Italian, exactly. And then I ended up at the University of Washington, got my business degree, and tried to figure out how could I go back into the industry and have a quality of life. Mm-hmm. Because I knew I wanted to be a mom, and I was worried about losing my nights and my weekends. Mm-hmm. Which and came first, Gourmando or the Gourmando mom Gourmando came first, okay. yeah. So. so you knew you wanted to be a mom, mm-hmm. and you knew you wanted something in the food industry. Right. But was there a moment where it was like, ah, aha, catering? Uh, it actually just came out of necessity. What I decided is I wanted to get into the food world, but I felt like the only way I could actually create some kind of, you know, Enough income and and not lose all my nights and weekends. I'd have to control my own destiny, which meant I'd have to open my own little place. So that's when I refinanced my car and I started the cafe with two other people at the time. It was just the three of us. And, um, you know, the idea was we were going to actually have these little packaged meals and deliver them for dinner. But we were we were the ahead of your was, time. Was not there. It was not yeah. happening. I'm like that's right. happening now. Yeah, yeah, it's happening now. Right, 20 years later. But at the time, there wasn't a market for it. It wasn't so innovative. Yes, it was interesting. So we just had these four tables, and we just, um, you know, we had a really nice lunch business. But there's no way you're going to make any kind of an income off of that. Mm-hmm. So did you have it, a business model and like a game plan? Oh yeah. Oh no, I had a whole business plan. I had I ran out an entire business mm-hmm. plan, and the idea was around this dinner delivery program, which did not come off the ground. And so it was a slow start. I mean, we would do, we would work like tirelessly and do $300 a day in sales. Uh You know, we'd have a little line out the door. Yeah. We'd have a little line out the door, but we only had four tables and it was grab and go and it was lunch. And I remember thinking, okay, how are we going to get this off the ground? This is too much work for And the other two were business partners? Yeah. So we'd all gone in together and we each made $600 a month. That was our take-home pay. Yeah. Wow. And where gross. were you living that was at the, the gross time? Amount. <laughs> I was in the Biltmore apartments. But like I was that... married at the time. Okay. Yeah. I was I married my college sweetheart and we were together and I remember we were struggling to figure out, you know, how to pay rent and, and how to get you know move forward and so it was really truly out of necessity that I thought what other revenue streams can we, you know, come up with to just yes. shore this restaurant, this little cafe? I was fairly confident. Was it called Gourmando? It was called Gourmando, and I was pretty confident we wouldn't make it the first year. Yeah. But, I, you know, I had a How lot of How did your business partners feel about it? Oh, they're like, we're out. And they, they were out. They were, they were nervous. Yeah. And But I had a lot of pride in the company, and I thought, let's just... Let's do the best we can. And the market is an incredible place to incubate a business. I mean, How did you the find community the is insane. Well, we found a tiny little four-leaf space right next to Madame Lazanga's tattoo okay. parlor. And she was our number one client. I mean, she was great. She was fabulous. Is she still there? Yeah, I love her. She actually moved across the street, but she was great. It, it must be nostalgic for you to go to the market it, now. Oh, I go all the time, and my kids go with yeah. me all the time. I want to go with you. It's really great because I know all these different vendors, and they really helped Gourmando. I mean, Louis Dealer Renti gave us a line of credit. Saul at Pure Food Fish gave me a little line of credit. Christy and Terry at Le Panier, they helped me out with the bread. And 24 years later, we still buy their baguettes for our sandwiches. We get like $8,000 a month now from them. But they were extending me credit and helping me and giving me little discounts. They bet on the right horse. When nobody would, you know, paid attention or really even thought we'd do anything. So we were really fortunate yeah, you know, that's amazing. And so walk me through. So you, the other partners were like, I'm out. Well, what happened was my first partner, she actually got pregnant, I think, after the second year. And she's like, you know, I want to be a stay-at-home mom. And I mm-hmm. said, oh, God bless. You know, I feel you there. And I, I think that makes sense. So she, I think, had invested $3,000. And I was like, oh, how am I going to come up with the money to 
you settle that. So I, I, I think I took a cash advance on my credit card, took care of that. And then interestingly enough, she had a fabulous little baby boy, and we were chatting, I think, a, when, the, when her little son was like three or four months, and she got emotional. And she's like, this is hard. I'm having a hard time figuring out how do I be a mom and, and still have something that's my own and contribute to, you know, to my family and, and have some source of income. And we were chatting, and I was like, I don't know. How about what if I just buy those little brownie cakes from you that you used to make for the little box lunches? I got to buy those, wholesale those to me. So she started wholesaling, then we put them in the box lunches, and now we get 12,000 of those from her every month. And she has that's her own incredible. little bakery Alyssa, in her house. That's, I mean, that so, alone, that's got to feel good. Just that alone. You know, I just think that really great businesses are built around relationships and around connection. And she puts the best possible product out and I am proud to serve it, you know, and, and she's a woman that I admire and I, I love doing business with and I have my own bakery. And so what happened I to the third? I can bake them all myself, yeah. you know, but, but I'll never touch those because I love what she because does. Because you're loyal and because you're you. Well, she's great. And so. she's good. And the brownies are good. <laughs> right. Well, my second business partner, we were in business together up until it was around 2008, 2009 and the economy was really in trouble and Gormando was taking a hard hit. Mm-hmm. And we just had very different ideas of how to move the company through that mm-hmm. crisis because we were struggling. I had almost bankrupt the company in 06 and from some aggressive business growth decisions, which we, we learned a lot from. But mm-hmm. we were back on our feet and then the recession hit and it was real clear that we had to move quick and we had to be willing to pivot. And we couldn't get in an alignment. I think he really wanted to be conservative and just wait out the storm. And I wanted to take it as an opportunity to, to just jump into more market share and to it double sounds like down. Your, sounds like your mom. Fearless. Yes, just like my mom, right? Yeah. Right. And so, and so in what way did you do? Did you pivot? So basically, we ended up uh, ending the partnership. I bought him out, and then I just went in big. So I, we started marketing heavier, and we started, you know, looking at how do we refresh the brand, and and um, how do we. Um, you know, expand our platform and refresh the mm-hmm. website. So just jumping into that. And we so started you went into seeing debt a lot more. In order to grow. It, you know, we did take on a little bit of debt to, to grow. Mm-hmm. And the challenge was we we were just barely breaking even. But I had some cash that we'd been sort of, you know, holding on reserves. Yeah. On reserves. So we deployed that and we didn't we held steady with all of the quality. We never, you know, adjusted any of that. We're mm-hmm. like just just continue to reach out and, mm-hmm. and see. And who what we was can your capture. go-to at the time? It was usually my mom. Your yeah, mom. yeah, my mom and my dad. They were both great. I mean, they were really always there. And yeah. I think once again, they just believed in me. Even when I wonder if they actually really did, they sure seemed like they did. Right, it gave <laughs> you, know? you the confidence to kind of, of push forward. At what time did you feel successful for the first time? Oh, it's such an interesting question. I think as an entrepreneur, you never feel like you've got it right. You're Do you feel successful learning. now? Actually, for the first time, it was about two years ago. I think as you grow a company, and, and I've never taken on, um, uh, you know, I, I own the company 100% myself now, and, and I don't have any private investors. I've never, you know, given away equity, and I don't have, the only debt I have is a little bit of bank debt. And about two years ago, we closed out the, the company. And I think when you have bank debt, you always feel like if something horrible happened, the bank kind of owned mm-hmm. you. So mm-hmm. you never really feel like it's all yours. And so about two years ago, when we were closing out the year end and tying up the books, uh, it was when I realized, you know, the company was so healthy. We'd, we'd done a really good job of preserving capital and mm-hmm. taking out debt and, and building up reserves that, mm-hmm. you know, I I owned every crappy pot and pan, every vehicle, all That's of gotta it. Feel good. It was all mine. And that yes. felt really good. And that yes. felt like, you know what, it, it, it truly is mine. And yes. that was a moment. Was there any sort of moment in time in the past... 24 years. I know you've had a great run this past Mm -hmm, several years mm -hmm. um, where you're like, holy smokes, we just got such a big order. This kind of changed our business. We never had a massive order that shifted the business, but I will say that we entered into new markets that were profoundly impactful on the company. Mm -hmm. And I'll try and kind of make this, you know, as tight as I can. But in 06, I wanted to go into this corporate dining world, which is where a lot of great 
larger companies, they have their own campuses. Mm -hmm. And so, you, like an Amazon has their mm -hmm. campus, Microsoft has their campus. And we were given and awarded an opportunity to go on to a corporate campus as their food operator. And it, I was a million-dollar company at the time. This was another million-dollar book of business. So I was literally going to yes. double the company overnight. And I was super excited about it. I thought there's a huge opportunity for success there. Mm -hmm. We went into it. We'd never been – we'd never done it before. We didn't know what we didn't know. And it, it just blew up on me. I couldn't catch up to it. You know, we, we – <laughs> uh, big you lesson over, learned. You over -promised You and... know, well, no, what happened was we didn't really understand the actual market. You know, mm -hmm. we, were, we were being awarded the project by the executive team. But actually, when we started opening these cafes and working with the people who were supporting the cafes, the different employees, it was a lot of people from shipping and receiving. And it was a lot of people who were looking for just really nice, economical, approachable meals. And we had little, you know, we had wild mushroom you were rice Gormando. cakes and crab yeah. cakes and, and yeah. little salads. And they're like, hey, um, when are you going to do the chili dogs? And I thought, uh oh, well, that's a problem. Oh, oh dear. And yeah. so I think we needed to learn to understand the voice of the customer and then make sure that we created products that supported it. So we're never going to do a chili dog, but we did do a really great bratwurst with roasted peppers, and we got those from Uli's in the market. And and I think the challenge with that project was it, it was very complex. It was in a space we'd never been, and I literally took the company to bankruptcy. I mean, I took it to the mats. I, I lost $300,000 in about three months. I couldn't catch up to it, and we were literally losing the company. I had the bookkeeper come in in tears, and she's like, I don't know what you're going to do about payroll. We're now on COD. Nobody's delivering to us. We're in big trouble. And what year was this? This was in 06, and I remember I'm, I just... It was happening so fast, I couldn't keep up. I were just you, couldn't. Were you married with kids? I mean, yeah, I had two little okay. kids at home, and I, and I, I just, I remember thinking, oh my God, I'm going to lose the company. I've got 50 employees at the time, and I'm like, and some of them had been with me for like eight years, and I'm like, I, I cannot believe one stupid decision, and I'm going to lose it all. It's going, I'm losing everything. And I remember I went home that night, and I, I called my mom, and I'm like, Mom, I screwed up. I'm going to yeah. lose this company. At 10 years, I made one stupid choice, and I'm going to lose everything. And she got quiet, and then she goes, oh, shut up. And I was like, what? I'm like, Mom, that's not empathetic. You didn't even hear me. She's like, no, I heard you fine, Alyssa. She's like, we're entrepreneurs. This is what we do. We play Vegas, okay? She's like, here's a news flash. You're going to make mistakes, and you'll make more. It's not the mistake that matters because we all do that. It's how you recover that's going to define you. So if you could just oh gosh, get over chills. get over yourself and start figuring out how you're going to fix it, that's where you're going to find your success. Wait, I And it was huge. For real. No, it was huge. It Go was. mom. For me, it gave me, it was like, well, first of all, it was, an, it was a huge epiphany. And it also, it, it gave me kind of like this open door to stop beating myself up. I was so ashamed. I was so angry at myself. I couldn't stop thinking about the failure. And it allowed me to let that go and just focus on how am I going to get out of this? So I took the weekend. I, re I figured out how we were going to work through it. Did you do that by yourself? I did it all by myself, yeah. And so then I, um, you know, and I did what my dad always told me. It's all about integrity. You know, it's all about being honest. And so I called all my vendors. I'm like, hey, hello, it's Alyssa. Yeah, okay, yeah, I know I haven't paid you in like two or three months. And guess what? I'm not going to pay you for a little bit longer, but I am going to pay you. And it's probably only going to be about two or $300 this week, but I'm going to keep it up. I need you to, I just, you, I just need you to not give up on me for about another 30, 60 days. I got this. I've been doing this 10 years. I promise you I'm going to do it for another 20. I need you to bet on me on this. And you know what was awesome about all these vendors? And God bless Ron Rosella and Rosella's produce. That man kept a lot of us in business and he's an extraordinary man. But um, he, and he in particular, he's like, Alyssa, I'm not happy about this. All right. But I got you. You take care of business. I got you. And a lot of the vendors were like that. And in first, and that's why I think relationships are so important because everybody's going to have a time when they trip. And when you have your community that's there like, hey, okay, we believe in you. You're not going to fail them. 
you know, it makes you feel even that much more like determined to be successful. And they gave me a runway. Oh my gosh. And did I got you say this it. in your Ernst and Young interview. I'm I like, don't know that I, I did. got chills. I'd be like, <laughs> I want her to win. I mean, Thank this is you. incredible story. Well, but you know, the best part of the story is that we How did you we get out were, of it? What'd so you here's do? the deal. I took I was operating in all these cafes as if they were their own little restaurants, full inventory, full staff, the whole bit. And we couldn't pencil it. We were losing too much cash. And it was it was it was brutal. So we reduced it all down, and we just basically started commissarying everything from Gourmando, doing a really beautiful grab and go program, and just having this little grab and go feature in these cafes. We had to get out of the program, the contract. The contract was about to end, and we I knew financially I had to stabilize the company. Can you say the company that you were doing? Well, this it was for? actually we were working with Group Health, and they oh, are okay. a great company, but we just couldn't we couldn't do the program, mm-hmm. and so we got out of that and. But I tell you, I was like, you know what? I'm going to learn from this. I'm going to come back to it. And ironically, three, four years later, I came back into it, but I took what I learned, which is if we do a beautiful program and we do small spaces and we just do grab and go, we can create a nice amenity for these corporate partners Mm -hmm. that allows them to give a high quality product to, to their working families, to their employees. That's fast and convenient at a fraction of the cost of these heavily subsidized big corporate campus programs. And it's now become the fastest growing division of the company. Mm -hmm. And it's been a big part of the success of the business. I mean, I've tripled the size of the company in three years. And these cafes are a really strong driver in that. So so do they drive the menu or you do like an RFP or how does that work? You know, we, well, we obviously learned a lot from the, you know, big mistakes in the beginning, but we want to make sure that we've got the right audience, that they like our food. And then we present a proposal and we Mm -hmm. talk it through and we'll customize different pieces for them. And then um, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll pop open these different cafes. And what's nice is we can have a holistic approach to support the employees of the building. If you need catering, if you need box lunches, whatever you need, we can really take care of it. So there's synergies to the other divisions of the company. So it's very healthy for the business. Yes. So we see a lift throughout all the divisions of the company. Yeah. And how many employees do you have now? 253. I mean, obviously you've got people working driving Mm -hmm. the trucks and you've got people working in the cafes, every different type of human being. Is there a common thread among a Gourmando employee? You know, this I think is probably one of the things I'm most proud of. We did, we've we done some different surveys like, you know, okay, what do you think of Gourmando? Or what's one word? What would you say? And the word that keeps coming up is family, which, which I love because yes. for me, when I started Gourmando, I knew I wanted to have kids and I knew I, I wanted to be home to pick up my kids from school. My parents worked hard and we were latchkey kids. And I remember thinking, hey, when it's my turn, when I'm up to bat, if I open a company, I want to try and and, and take their sacrifices and see if I can do it a little differently. Mm-hmm. So I decided if I was going to start my business that I wanted to create a plan where we could do a production schedule so that everybody could be off in time to see their kids and pick them up from school. If I wanted that, if I valued it, then I wanted to offer that value to the teams. So people so work part-time? Everybody works from about 5 in the morning till about 1 in the afternoon, mm-hmm. 1 or 2 in the afternoon, 80% of the team. We still have some people in the office that will you know grab calls until 5, but 80% of the company is gone in time to pick up their kids. Even the cafes are closing by, you know, 3 o'clock. So it's important to me, and I developed a whole business around that. And That's you, so unique. Well, we also close the company down between 10.15 and 10.45, and we have a family lunch together. And I think that's one of the most critical times of the day because that's when the teams are collaborating and they're talking and there's a community there. So I, I think those are the values that, you know, circling back to what we talked about in the beginning, mm-hmm. that might not be for everybody. But I know they're important to me because Mm -hmm. money comes and goes. Well, I think everybody listening probably has similar values, but the how... That's the tricky is the part. hard part. Yeah. How have you done this? Like, how do you I stay organized? You, is it like, hey, don't check my email, or I do work at night after the kids are no, about? Like, no. How do you do all this? I think it takes, for me, it took a lot of discipline. It's hard. Once again, as an entrepreneur, you feel like the way you add value is by working the hardest, working the longest, doing everything for the company, showing, leading by example. And I think what I learned is that I had to be honest with myself and recognize where I actually do add value for the business mm-hmm. and where I get in the way. Yes. And then making sure that I bring in really, really really strong leadership to support those areas where the company really needs help, where I just can't, Mm -hmm. can't, I don't what have is, the what are your ninja to skills it. today? I would say for me, it's about business development, business strategy, brand. You know, uh, those are the things, and and culture and community within mm-hmm. the company. Those are important. The, the high touch things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm not a good operator. I am not good at the details.
bills. Right. And so bringing in a president, we have a, a Jonathan Zimmer, who is our president, who is absolutely extraordinary. He's a world-class talent. And he's just an extraordinary operator. Mm-hmm. And he's great at execution. Yes. And I know so, that you're really happy with your chef, too. Oh, my gosh. My chef's extraordinary. I have to tell you. I mean, I mean your team. The for those team, team members insane. listening, yeah. Alyssa brags about you guys all the time. No, Bill Morris is a rock star. Yes. He's insane. I mean, and he commands such extraordinary respect within our industry. And he's our executive chef. And I'm immensely proud to work with mm-hmm. him. But I'll tell you something. We often say as entrepreneurs, oh, you know, hire people who are smarter or more educated, who are more experienced. I think that's just the ticket to the big show. I think the magic happens when you get out of their way. Yes, let them do their thing. let them be their greatness. And my job is to give them the resources and the support to do great things. Right. And that's not just at the leadership level. That's in the dish pit. That's with the drivers. That's with the cafe workers. That's on the line. That's with the customer service teams. Mm -hmm. You want talent all around you. Are you running ads and hoping they respond? Are you asking around to find out who's really good in the industry? industry and then going out and actively recruiting? It's a combination. I mean, we're always, we always have ads out. We're always looking for people. And then it's also the teams, like who, who do you know who's, who mm-hmm. has, who's got a lot of talent, who's, who's hungry to work and mm-hmm. wants to learn. And so a lot of times within your own network, when you have great people who work with you, yes. they often have a no network of great people. And so that's important. I know that you've talked about some of the failures Mm -hmm. and that you're kind of as an entrepreneur, not ever really feeling 100% successful. But is there a moment of like, oh, if we hit X in profit or revenue or corporate campuses that we're on that I will feel like we've arrived. I think for me, success looks like, I, you know, I've got a balanced life. I'm involved in this community. I'm producing a product that I'm proud of and that I've got teams that I can support. I'll, I like growing the company. I have a lot of energy around that, and the teams are hungry for it. So I want us to continue to grow. I want us to move into secondary markets. I want us to – we're looking at a, opening and launching a retail line in the grocery stores. Mm-hmm. So there's lots of Ooh, that would be exciting, cool. I think, opportunities for us that we're in the middle of pursuing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think that, you know, I want to want to make sure that whatever I develop – for the business also is thoughtful and intentional for the quality of life for the teams. And you asked about, you know, how do I create my schedule? And I only work two and a half days a week. Yes. I, I, and I've had that schedule for you need, 20 you, years. You need to talk more about that yeah. because I'm sure people listening are blown away to hear that. Well, when I had my daughter, um, she was really tricky. She was a very hard baby. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, God, this is a really this is a very challenging job here. And I, I realized at that moment, I'm like, I don't think I can ever work full time again. This child is very, very difficult. And I don't know if I'm good at the mom job. I need way more time and effort into this. And so I made a decision that I would never work full time again. And But it was really hard because mm-hmm. it mean, meant I had to let go of things. Like and what? that's very vulnerable. When you're not there every day and you're not doing everything, you have to trust that the people you have in place are going to 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 do great things and they may make mistakes but you got to allow them to mm-hmm. make those mistakes i guarantee you they don't make them again what were you driven at the time by money no, actually, I really wasn't because I think what I had learned is that money was going to come and go. I had to be proud of what I was doing and I had to be growing and I had to be we, – we were always profitable except for 06. That was a disaster. We had a couple of years where we were pretty flat. But in general, it's been a healthy, profitable company that I've grown slowly. Mm-hmm. About three years ago, I really kicked it into high gear. I'm like, hey, what can we do? And that's mm-hmm. when we went off to the races. But my kids are a little bit older, too. Yeah. Um, so for me to keep that part-time schedule, it's about having a disciplined schedule. It means if I don't work on Wednesdays and Fridays, I don't schedule anything on Wednesdays and Fridays. Mm-hmm. Because it's too easy to let it slip. Let it slip. And do you check your emails on Wednesdays and Fridays? No, no, no. Wow. Yeah. I never even had my emails linked to my phone until maybe about a year ago. Okay. And that and that helped so because who if I takes didn't have it. Those emergency calls. There's definitely two or three people that know where to get me, how to get a hold of me, and I'm always available if there's an emergency. If anybody texts me or calls me, they know I'm they're going to get a call within, you know, a minute. Mm-hmm. I'm available to them, but they also are great. They they don't call unless they know that hey, this needs to be dealt with, mm-hmm. and then we make sure it gets taken care of. And it's managing the team's expectations too. I mean, when I bring in leaders of the company, I'll say, "Hey, I want to give you tools and resources. I want you to be successful. That's critical." We need you to be successful. I 
want you to have, you know, to feel a sense of ownership mm-hmm. in the business. But I also want to tell you another another measurement of success is that I'm not here full time. Mm-hmm. I'm here two and a half days a week. If I'm here full time, something's probably gone terribly wrong in the company. Yes. And somebody might be getting it. And do you have any guilt? I don't. Because... When I'm there, I have meetings, I am I am engaged, I'm involved. Mm-hmm. And so I make sure that if I say I'm going to be there on that Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, I am there and I am present and I am. The teams are great about, hey, just the facts. Let's like drill into this stuff. Let's get it done. And they have a lot of support too. I do not micromanage anybody. Mm-hmm. And so I think they feel, you know, that they have the ability to, to make decisions mm-hmm. and that they have my support. I mean, I love that they would describe the company as like family as a word, but what word would they use to describe you? Oh gosh, I don't know. Come on, baby. Yeah. <laughs> I've I've heard before that like the owner of Gourmando leads from the heart, you know, and I do think that you That's know... so you. <laughs> That's not surprising. They said that you're yeah. a heart centered lady. <laughs> Thank you. But Your then I've intuition. also heard she leads with her heart, but she'll rule with an iron fist, you know? So oh, we have a we have a strong I've not team. seen that side yeah, yeah. of you. <laughs> I'd be scared. Oh, yeah. I think I've only can. seen you happy yeah, and like generous. Yeah. Well, you're so generous. Thank you. Thank you. I, yeah. I don't think you can run and grow a company for 24 years if you can't also make sure that you've got some chops and you're able to take a punch and you're able to get back up yeah. and, and you're able to swing when you need to swing. Yeah. So. And so you're not suffering from guilt. These are just some of the female kind of generalities that not I hear thrown around. What about imposter syndrome? I think I would suffer from guilt if I wasn't managing expectations. If I was telling people, I'll be there full time and I wasn't there, then I'd feel really guilty. And I did struggle with that in the beginning. When I was first shifting to part time, I had a hard time with it. Mm-hmm. But once I made that commitment and that's what I made everybody, it known. you know, expected, it was very easy. Mm-hmm. So I And what about imposter was... syndrome? I think yes. I think we all have that. At least I know for me, mm-hmm. you know. You... Like how did I get here in this room? Do I deserve to be here? I think that's an interesting question. I think that um I think I always feel like I'm never doing enough and I can always do more. Well, that's and what makes so, you successful. You know, maybe that's it. But mm-hmm. yeah, you never feel like, like, really? I'm in a podcast? Like, why does she want to talk to me? you got to be kidding me. I mean, know? I'm already, I've had a lot of incredible <laughs> leaders on the podcast and I'm already thinking of all the things that people are learning from listening to this oh. podcast. I'm learning <laughs> as a business owner. I mean, it's incredible. What do you do for you? Like, just to relax. Besides working two and a half days a week. I know, really. Yeah, but like truly, if you just want to chill. It's no secret that obviously I'm in food and I love the business food and, and mm-hmm. my kids are foodies too. And so we're kind of a food family and we, we often go to dinner. I think getting out of the house, getting away from the phones, having a meal together, cooking. Both my kids know how to cook and I think that's important too. So um, really, I haven't, I don't know that there's anything that I'm doing in a rhythm or in a routine. Mm-hmm. I mean, I like to read. We did some yoga. working out, doing the yoga. Yeah, yoga. I ne- really need to get a little bit more on the ball with all yeah. that. But well, it's yeah. helpful. It makes you feel good. It really does. Yeah. It really does. And what about um, your kids? Like, how do you like to spend time with them? And what do you think is most important as far as the legacy that you leave for them? I really want my kids to be humble. I want them to be kind, and I want them to know how to work hard. Those are really important, you Mm -hmm. know, and I think those are the tools where they will find their success. And, you know, I don't know what that will look like for them. Mm -hmm. They both seem very entrepreneurial to me. Uh, I'd love to potentially see them involved in the company, but that might not be where they find their voice. They Mm -hmm. may do their own thing. Um, My nine-year-old Layla, who you know, is uh like... Yeah, I'm going to be taking over Fuel Talent one day. And I'm like, actually, you need to go get a job. Well, I'm you don't just you get to I have want to tell you Fuel something. Talent. It's That's funny. just not yeah, how it yeah. is. Yeah, so both my kids started working at 14. And my daughter started in, in a dish pit and a retirement home. And when we came to see, we've always lived in Seattle. We lived in Bainbridge for a little while. And then we came back to Seattle. And um, she was looking for a job. And this was two years ago. And she was 17. And we had just opened three cafes. And I really needed just some warm bodies in the mm-hmm. cafes. And... So I talked to my cafe director. I said, hey, I know we need bodies. I can throw my daughter in there for, you know, just the summer. But I swear to God, if she sucks, yank her. I do not want her messing with the family name, you know. But just let's give her a shot. Let's Mm -hmm. see how she does. And 
she, she actually, to her credit, she worked really hard. And I didn't anticipate how passionate she would be about it. So I was proud. And at first, I'm like, oh, this is rainbows and unicorns. Look at her. She's the first one in. She's the last one to leave. What a great job. Second week, I'm like, uh-oh, oh, I don't know if I like this anymore. Every day, hey, I have a thought, Mom. I think we need this. I have been looking at this, and we need another chicken sandwich. I'm like, no, we don't. No, we don't. We're fine. Oh, no, we do. I talked to three different people. We've got to have one. I'm like, you have a chicken sandwich. So now all of a sudden, I've got pressure at home, right? This is a hilarious. A week goes by, and I, the, the chicken sandwich is like chirping in my ear every day. So I have to go to the management meeting. I'm like, what's going on with the chicken sandwich? Can somebody please make a new chicken sandwich? And they're like, no. We have a fabulous chicken sandwich. It's on a baguette. She's fine. Tell her she's fine. We don't know what she's talking about. She's like, oh, no, those only come on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We need a hot chicken sandwich. So I have to go back the next week because, and then I have a myriad of other, you know, suggestions, right? But she will not give up on the chicken sandwich. Good for her. Oh, it gets better. So the second week I go back and they're like, okay, we'll, we'll put it under consideration. Tell her we'll think about it. I'm like, okay, fine. So I tell her. She buys that for about a week. Then I come home. She's made prototypes of the chicken sandwich oh, that she her. believes needs to be sold at the cafes. And she tells me, could you please give these to the decision makers at the company? <laughs> I'm like, oh, my uh, God. <laughs> so I send one to give one to the executive chef, one to the president, one to the cafe director. And they're finally like, okay, that's it. We're putting the damn thing on the menu. That is so great. So, you have to give it her name. Oh, so that's the next thing. So then they say, we're going to name it the Olivia. I'm like, no, 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 no. There's no personal glory. I just want her off my back, okay? And they're like, no, it's going to be called the Olivia because if it's a good one, we want the other cafe team members to know, like, hey, if you get excited about something, this there's an great. opportunity. So we launched that thing. It's the number one selling sandwich in the whole cafe division. It's oh, been the number love... one selling sandwich okay, for so over a year. So this is me to you, Olivia. <laughs> Go, girl. Apparently, you're Alyssa's crazy. daughter yeah. and your grandmother's <laughs> granddaughter. Right, it exactly. runs. It runs thick in the family. Yeah, crazy. Fearlessness crazy. and tenacity. We like it. I think these are great qualities. Yeah. And, you know, and so th- that's my hope for both Olivia and my son, Joe. And, and you know, I, I'm real proud at how hard they work and how passionate they are. Well, and, it's no surprise that they're so. incredible. You're such a good Aww. mom. Yeah, Joe rolls into the cafes this summer, so this will be his first year. All right, well, I'll make a, good. a surprise yeah. appearance. Do you remember the guy that we met at that event, and you, like, somehow it came up that you were the Gramando founder and CEO, and he had worked at Amazon, and he went crazy. Oh, like, you were Madonna or, oh, like, Michael it, Jackson. Stop it, stop it, He no. just wanted to talk and talk and talk about his favorite meals. <laughs> that made my night. I mean, I mean it was so cute day. how it touched you were. To and I'm me. like, it, it's so you he to was... be so humble and be like, oh, really? You know who I am? And I was like, yes. No, People we do. sent a ton of food to him the next day. I was really, really appreciative of his compliments. That was cute. It, it, it meant a great deal to us. And, you know, that that was a great night. So, nice. Yeah. Um, okay, so my final question for you, mm-hmm. and I ask all of my guests, um, is what fuels you? In my business, we have the opportunity to... Um, Actually, to create opportunities for people that I believe are often underserved in our community. And I think if I look at what fuels me, what I'm proud of is 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 having a company that can can create these opportunities for people who might have English as a second language or for people who are starting from a tough background and they just need a new new shot at life or a second a second start or you know at risk youth who are coming to us off the streets you know watching them succeed and watching them grow with the company is profoundly and of um impactful to me and you know I had a dishwasher this was about 4 or 5 years ago and I was Lucy, she's amazing. She was our dishwasher at the time and vivacious, great personality. And I walked by her and she gives me this huge hug. Like, oh, Lucy, hello. I'm loving this hug. What is happening here? What are we celebrating? And she said, you know, Alyssa, I didn't want to say it because I was ashamed. But when I came here, I, I lived on the streets and I was homeless. And you guys gave me a shot and you gave me an opportunity. And I, you know, I eat lunch with everybody every day. And I feel like I'm a part of this place. And I feel like I'm a part of this community. And she's like, and today I signed the lease on my very first apartment. And she's like, I oh. just wanted to thank you. So then, of course, I'm emotional. She's emotional. And I was That's like, incredible, and I was like, Lucy, I can I need to tell you how grateful I am to be a part of this. I'm like, I am so proud of you. And this is a gift to be able to help celebrate this with you. So those are the things that fuel me. And Aww. I think I want to say one other thing. I think in my, com- in my community, in the restaurant industry, 
it, it might sound silly, but you think about like the Statue of Liberty, you know, like bring me your masses. We're often the gatekeepers. We're those that are helping support, lifting people up. We're helping them. We're not giving them a handout. We're giving them a hand up. Mm-hmm. We're creating resources and opportunities for for people to to get livable wages and 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 to advance. Mm-hmm. And not every industry can do that. And I take an enormous amount of pride in being able to to hopefully help lift up people who are coming to us who just who, who want to work hard and they just need a shot. I love that. And Lucy's just one story of like you just happened to intersect with that day, but I'm sure there's hundreds oh, yeah. that like you've tons. touched along the years, yeah. and that's got to be incredibly rewarding. Yeah, it's been so, very rewarding. Thank for you us. for coming on thank the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Fun. Appreciate it. Okay, thank can we go shop you. now? Yes, let's do okay, it. Okay, let's go shopping. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you for listening to the What Fuels You podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, and follow us on social media to keep up with the latest news and episodes. You can also contact us at podcast at fueltalent.com to provide feedback, ask questions, and share topics or guests you would like us to cover in the future. We hope you feel inspired by our guests and that we have helped fuel your day. Join us next time for another episode of What Fuels You.